Well, let's let's um I, I do want to focus in on 31 and 32 for a few minutes here. To the Jews who have believed in him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. There's like this sequential order uh, in freedom. So I, I just want to show a real quick clip. This um I think this will set the tone. This brings out the holiness. I'm sorry, we have no midsize available at the moment. I don't understand. I made a reservation. Do you have my reservation? Oh, yes, we do. Unfortunately, we ran out of cars. But the reservation keeps the car here. That's why you have the reservations. I know why we have reservations. I don't think you do. <laughs> if you did, I'd have a car. <laughs> See, you know how to take the reservation. You just don't know how to hold the reservation. And that's really the most important part of the reservation, the holding. Anybody can just take them. Let me uh, speak with my supervisor. Uh. Anybody could take a reservation, but not everybody can hold. Everybody, we could believe in the reservation, but we don't hold on to it. Jesus is speaking to those Jews who believe in him. They have the reservation, but they do not know how to hold the reservation. They do not know how to hold to the teachings of Jesus. And the question for us, missionaries, microchurch leaders, people who like want to follow after God, is are we making believers or are we making disciples? How do we make disciples in our microchurch? And guys, I think sometimes we get a little mixed up here. We, we think that we should act as mental health counselors. That's what this person really needs. They need a listening ear, and that's going to deliver them freedom. Or we think that we're life improvement specialists. That's really what we're doing in microchurch. We're giving advice to people, and that's how they're going to find the path that leads to eternal life. Sometimes we, we lead as if we're providing like anxiety reduction medicine or solutions for loneliness. Like That's driving us. And we think, man, if, if our microchurch can provide that, then there's life, there's freedom, there's deliverance. And that right now, tonight, there will be women selling their bodies and men choosing to beat their wives. And we believe that they need our microchurch event. They need to come have dinner at our house. That's what they need. If only they, got, they come in contact with us in our Bible study, then there would be freedom. There would be deliverance. There would be redemption. And we fall into the trap that we often, what we do is make believers, believers in our events, believers in our Bible study, believers in our conversations, believing in all that stuff is good. That's the trap. It's not that it's evil to have a listening ear. It's not that it's evil to have dinner in a Bible study. It's believing that that brings life. We think redemption comes. We often make believers and not disciples. And we want to give freedom to folks. We want to give freedom from their past, right? From their insecurities, from their addictions, from their loneliness. But do we think that freedom for them comes because they change their minds about something? That if they would just change their mind about belonging to pornography, then they would be set free. That if they would just think differently about the cross and the resurrection of Jesus, well, they would be truly free then. Our theories of change, our discipleship methodology, oftentimes, the, 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 the idea of theory of change, like how humans become new creation. Our belief in the theory of change, like how that change occurs from human, or really what's meant to be subhuman, to new creation in the new heaven and new earth, is often grounded in us doing what is true, deciding what is true, and then mentally ascending to it. Even with us here at the underground, our actions often expose the truth about us. Because I believe in a lot of things. And my, my actions often reveal the truth about it. Like, I believe in, um, I don't know, obeying traffic laws until the traffic's just a little too slow. 
to my liking. <laughs> and I don't hold on to the traffic law, but I exchange it for my convenience. And I believe in being healthy, kind of as a moral duty, uh, until that fifth cookie uh, it tempts my soul. And I don't hold on to my health convictions, but I exchange that moral compass for the sugar dopamine hit. And I believe every human should be free without the fear of slavery. But when I check my electronic devices without thought for the slaves that mine the cobalt and the lithium ion batteries that exist in every battery on the face of the earth, I concede that I might be okay with a little bit of slavery in the world, as long as I don't see it. And I believe in Jesus, 100%. And I reject the devil, 100%. But my actions speak louder than words. Knowing about and believing in Jesus, this is something we're familiar with. We're familiar with this arena. But holding on to his teaching, this is what separates tradition from a worldview. Holding on to his teachings divides the children of God from the sons of Satan. It is a hard text. Do we make disciples or just mere believers who will kill Jesus as soon as they disagree with him? Do we hold on to his teaching? Or do we exchange his teaching for lies? This is what Tomi wrote. Uh, Jessica read it earlier. This is where we find something interesting. Truth isn't something we land on and then decide to walk in. Some truth can only be found in the walking. Only after we make the leap of faith to hold on to his teachings, we learn how true they really are. Do I hold on to his teachings even when I don't understand them? Even if I don't understand how true they are? Uh, vaccines have become important the past couple of years. You guys familiar with vaccines? Everybody's heard about vaccines, right? We won't get into the technicalities between the old vaccines and mRN, uh, MRA, uh, you, you know what I'm talking about, mRNA vaccines, yeah, um, on all the conspiracy theories and all that stuff. But early on in vaccine development, some of you guys know this story, it, it, it came out of the Middle East, the original vaccine, and um, people would just kind of take pus and then like stab people with the pus from a smallpox, <laughs> which is so gross. <laughs> and you know, it, it it proved to be very effective. But I think it was like 30% of the people still died from the vaccine. So, I mean, vaccine injuries. Okay, 30% used to die from vaccines, right? But it was better than smallpox. So it was worth the risk. But they're trying to figure out, like, okay, if we just can't get the masses vaccinated, like 30% of the population cannot die. So we can't purposely just stab people with pus until they found out that milkmaids never died from smallpox. Like the woman that would milk the cows never died from smallpox. And, and, and some folks in England were just like, okay, this is really strange. Like, why isn't this happening? Like everybody dies from smallpox. Why is this pop? Come to find out, cows have a similar uh, virus on their udders and the girls would get it on their hands. And then after they recovered from that, they were immune to smallpox. It was, it was a slight adjustment to the vaccine. There was a slightly different virus in the world. And what they needed was to expose everybody to cow udders. They took the pus from the cow udders and they started stabbing people with it. That's what they did. <laughs> and smallpox ceased to being this global epidemic. Like people survived smallpox. People wouldn't get it anymore. Now here's the thing. They had no idea how that worked. They did not understand how that worked. They were like baffled by why that would work. All they knew, it worked. We should expose people to cow udders and they live. And it's only later through science and through development and through microscopes and all this scientific development, only later do they understand the truth of what they were living. 
like hundreds of years, like a hundred years later. Oh, that's what's happening. They, they had no idea. They lived into it. Guys, do we hold on to his teachings even if I don't understand how true they are? Or do I set myself up as king and judge of his teachings? Well, I don't quite understand how true this is, so I'm going to opt out of this teaching. It's a little confusing. I don't quite understand. I don't like it. It's not popular. Whatever it is, we have our little excuses. We have our little uh, acceptable sins. We're like, hey, it's a little conflicting to my lifestyle choices, and so I'm going to go in this direction over here, and I'm going to find ways to just, like, even though I don't understand, what's that one song? Even when I don't understand, like, I'll sing your praises, praise before my breakthrough, something like that. Like, you know what I'm talking about? That song is like, even when I don't understand, I will, I will worship you. I will praise you. Even when I don't understand. I, and I actually love that. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I took the, did I actually tell the story? Did I tell about taking the youth into uh, Ybor City? No? Okay, great. Remember that, guys? We went to Ybor City? Like, during, par- during party time, we said, hey, we're going to do some prayer walking. Well, it was a Friday night? Friday night, yeah. We said, we're going to get some pizza in Ebor, and we're going to prayer walk the strip. And, and they're going to walk down, and they're going to, like, you know, do listening prayer. And they're, they're kind of praying through the Lord's Prayer as they walk down. And then they were doing listening prayer on the way up and, like, trying to get a sense for God's heart for, for the people on the strip or whatever. And, you know, it, it was still kind of early, to be honest. But, man... Anybody been down there? You, you don't have to admit it. That might be the acceptable sin. You know what I'm talking about, though. It gets a little crazy, okay? <laughs> it gets a little wild. Like, even earlier, you're kind of like, dang, bro, it's like 9 p.m., man. <laughs> like, what, like, how long you been at it? You, you've been at it for a minute, okay? Like, maybe from yesterday, you've still been at it. So, so I let them kind of go in, like, little small groups. And uh, I, I don't really believe in safetyism, so I'm like, Fly, little birdies, right? But I'm also trying to be a responsible adult. So I'm like following them slowly, just to kind of keep an eye out, you know, if someone tries to get a little, you know, crazy or whatever. It's like, I'm like the bouncer, the Jesus bouncer, right? So I'm following them, and you can tell they're, they're kind of like, what the, you know, <laughs> what is happening here? This is nuts. And so they're try- they, they would stop at little corners, and they would like pray and try to like, it, you know, they're just exercising those muscles, those spiritual muscles, trying to hear from Jesus, trying to pray, trying to discern his heart, trying to like be filled with compassion for the people around them, all that kind of good stuff, right? What's interesting is anytime I go to Ebor during the party times, people just come up to me. I don't know why they come up to me. I don't necessarily, I, I, for the most part, people say I look like a cop or a Marine. But the crazy people always come up to me. I always find their way to me and start talking to me, start wanting to interact with me, whatever. So it happened twice, you know, in this very short kind of night, this prayer walk. And I'm like trying to pay attention to these kids. So kind of coming back, so we kind of walk down. We got some ice cream, great ice cream shop down there. Got some ice cream. Um, and then we're walking back, and they're out in front of me. I'm trying to pay attention. But this guy like kind of shuffles up next to me, like right behind me. And I'm aware of his presence. I could also smell him, um, the alcohol. I could sm- it, was, it was very strong. And, um, and I'm just like kind of ignoring the dude because I'm like, man, I don't want to talk to this, this crazy people. Like, why, why do crazy people always find me? I don't understand. I'm, I'm focused. I got a job to do. I got to like make sure these kids are okay or whatever. But he just starts talking to me, you know. And what the F is happening in the world? Man, this dude, like, what's happening here? He starts talking. What is real? I was like, what's real? Is this a Scientologist? What is going on here? I was like, man, I don't know what's real. What's up and what's down? So I started messing with him because I'm kind of like that. So I was like, what's up and what's down? I don't know. He's like, exactly. What is effing up and down? He was like, and then, you know, spittle and stuff like that. I was like, bro, I am trying, not trying to get vaccinated by you. <clears throat> it's gross. And uh, so he, I, mean, I start, he's just walking with me at this point. So we're just walking down the strip. And I'm like half messing with him. It's like, man, I don't, I, what's my left and right? What's, my le- what's to my left and what's to my right? I don't even know. 
you know? He's like, man, that's deep. It's like, you know, I don't know what's, what's going on. And then he starts basically crying, sobbing, not crying, not weeping. He starts sobbing. I'm so effed up. I don't know. I've ruined my life, you know. I'm like, oh, goodness, what is happening right now? But I got these kids, so I just keep on walking to this place. where we, I Finally, we stopped. I could see where they, they stopped up there. So I, I, so I was like, all right, man, I guess, I guess I'm talking to you, you know. He's like, I'm a doctor. I save lives. And I can't save my own. I'm an effing alcoholic. I was like, that's obvious, bro. It's obvious. And so I started asking questions, man. Like, do you ever feel like, have you ever asked God for help? Have you ever asked Jesus for help? You know, I'm trying. It's like, nah, man, you're not trying. I'm saying, have you ever cried out for Jesus to intersect your life? You know? So I basically start sharing the gospel with them, right? Trying to be a good evangelical. Share the gospel with them. But I'm like, man, is he going to remember this? I don't know. Probably not. I mean, probability, no. And I'm just like, bro, can I can I just pray for you? I got to go hang out with these kids. Like, we're in Ebor. It's only going to get crazier. I'm pretty sure they haven't seen nudity yet, but it's coming. <laughs> so I need to, like, hurry this up. <laughs> like, get back to the house. <clears throat> None of them noticed Coyote Ugly. There's this woman <laughs> taking off her shirt. <laughs> <laughs> dancing, I and mean, she, she had like a swim top on or whatever, but I was just like, they, they had passed right before that. I was like, oh man, thank you, Lord. <laughs> like, it's about to get crazy down here. So I'm like, man, can I pray for you? So I just, I just prayed for him. I was like, God, would you just help him remember this moment? Would you, like, would you do something right now that I can't do? Would you touch his heart? Whatever, right? That type of prayer. And I walk away. Here's the thing. I don't, I don't know, and I don't understand anything about that situation. I don't know why crazy people tend to find me. I don't understand how the aroma of Christ works. I don't understand how light and dark places works. All I know is that I have to hold on to his teaching, and I have to care for the dying and the sick and the lonely. And that there's principalities and powers that exist in the world that are not my friend. And that there is something spiritually happening on 7th Avenue. And I'm a part of that journey. I'm a part of creating the sense of mobile temple that Tommy's talking about. But I don't understand it. You see what I'm saying? I don't understand. But I have to hold on to his teaching that, Lord, you might be up to something. And so maybe I should talk to this crazy person. And maybe he's not as crazy. Maybe he's just broken. And maybe I should look him in the eye. And I don't know if he's going to remember anything, guys. I don't know if that, I don't know how prayer works. I don't know how compassion actually works. But I hold on to his teaching that we should have compassion the way he has compassion. I hold on to his teaching that maybe we should pray, that maybe we should cry out to God, that he might actually do something. I hold on to a hope that I don't see in front of me. You guys want to know what I'm talking about. This is what faith is. I hold on to the teachings of Jesus, and I have hope. God, would you do something? But I don't understand it. I'm just, a, I'm just me, and I'm frail, and I'm confused a lot. And i got to get these kids back home. Do we make believers, or do we make disciples of Jesus, who hold on to his teachings even when we don't understand them? Do we hold on to his teachings because we trust him? About the poor, do we trust him about the world, about human dignity, about compassion, but also the hard stuff, his judgment, his second coming? Do we hold tightly to his grip on us and the destiny of his church? Guys, if you have somebody who needs freedom, or you need freedom in your life, 
This text says, hold on to his teachings. When you drift from your belonging in Christ Jesus, hold on to, that's your return compass. God, I, I, I don't know if I belong to you. I'm calling it into question. Do you see me? Do you hear me? And I'm saying, this text is saying, hold on to his teachings, even when you don't understand. When your apathy and tradition and your stubbornness deaden your passion, dilute your devotion, and numb your mission, hold to the teachings of Jesus. Hold to the teaching that you are no longer a slave, that you are a child of God, that your fears were drowned in his perfect love. This is the place of our agency. You can't make yourself a child of God. But you can't hold on to his teaching. Then you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. We want to have a, a bit of a response time. A bit of a, like a Lord, investigate my heart. We're going to put up two questions. Kind of create the, the background. Maybe, maybe the band can come up and just kind of you know, um, lead us in some background music. But let's investigate our heart. Can we investigate and say, how have my actions pointed to the teachings of Jesus? But also, how do my actions expose in exchange? I'm exchanging his teachings for comfort. I'm exchanging his teachings for tradition. I'm exchanging his teaching for lies. Can we investigate our hearts briefly here?